Heavenly Father, we love you and we thank you because you are the God of grace. You're the, you're the, you're the God of comfort, the Father of compassion, Lord God. You are merciful and mighty and Lord God, we come to you today confessing that we need your mercy. We need your mercy. We need your strength, God. We need your wisdom. We need to sense your presence with us, Lord, to help us stay on course. Because life is hard and we're tired. But we're excited to be here, God. We're so excited to open up your word and we thank you that you have left a written recording of the life, the ministry, the death, resurrection, ascension of Jesus Christ and the explosion of your church, Lord. We thank you that you've provided us a means of knowing you. Thank you that you are the God who not just makes himself known, but so deeply desires for us to know you. Thank you for that, Lord. And so today, God, let us just come away knowing you better. We ask this in the mighty name of Jesus, our Savior, and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So I'm, I'm very stoked that we're talking about uh, the gospel of Mark, Marky Mark. I like him so much because Mark writes like I shop. I'm gonna explain that to you. Um, I am, I, I'm what I like to call a very girly tomboy, okay? Um, did I build my outfit today solely on my shoes? Oh, yes, I did. Yes, I did. That was very much on purpose. Do I love the hair? Do I love the makeup? Yes, I do. I love it so very, very much. Here's what I don't like, and this is where I go a little bit uh, neuroatypical if we're just going to stereotype women, which I don't love to do. But if we're going to generalize, here's what I don't like that kind of, you know, puts a, a mark on my woman card. I don't like rom-coms, like ever, at all. Not even when they have that cute little blonde girl. What's her name? I see, I can't even remember. I, I just don't like them. And I feel, I'm feeling the disapproval. I'm feeling it. It's okay, I'm strong enough to do this. I don't like the Hallmark Channel. Not even during Christmas. I'm so sorry. I'm not sorry. I'm not even sorry. That's the problem. I'm tempted to stand up here and lie to make you like me a little bit better. But I'm just going to let you in on a secret that I discovered one day when I did get stuck on the Hallmark Channel and I watched maybe four, maybe five movies. They're all the same. Like as long as we know this, okay? As long as we know what we're watching, we know it's always the same plot, right? Just different characters and different twists. Okay, here's the last thing that I don't like to do that makes, you know, another black mark on my woman card. I just don't like to shop. One of the great, um, one of the great things of our age is that we can now online shop. And that, girls, that is how I do it. I know where I'm going. I go there. I get it. I get out. Here's how, here's how my um, sisters and my mother shop. And this is why I, I just can't shop with them. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll go to the mall, of course, because that's where the most stores are in one place. And we can't just go where we need to go, even even if we know we're getting a sweater at The Gap. We have to go in all of the sweater stores and we've got to pick everything up and we got to touch it. We got to touch it. We got to feel it and we got to try it on. And I don't know. What do you think? I don't know. And I don't know if I want it, but I know I don't want anybody else to buy it. So I'm going to put it on hold in case I change my mind. But in the meantime, we're going to go to all the other stores and we're going to try everything on. And that is not how I do it. That is not how I do it. I shop swiftly with a purpose. Where do we need to go? There it is. Let's chart the fastest path. Okay, we're there. Don't look at the kiosk, people. Don't make eye contact. No, you just go, you get your thing, and you get out. And that is how Mark writes, right? He is swiftly with a purpose. He likes action verbs. He likes verb tenses that insinuate continuing action. And sometimes, as we're going to see today, we're just in the middle of an action scene and, and here comes another action scene that has already started in the middle of this action scene. And so before this action scene is even over, we're on 
on to the next action scene. And Mark's like, keep up, just keep up. That's all you gotta do is just keep up. And so what Mark does, and Chris has explained this very well, he states his purpose right up front. This is the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then he spends the rest of the gospel proving it. So in the next few weeks, you're gonna hit the great crescendo of the gospel of Mark. This is the point that Mark is working us toward. And it's the question he asks Peter in Mark 8, 29, and that's this, who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? The entire point of Mark's gospel is that you and I would walk away with an answer to that question, who do you say that I am? And he's really, like at the end of the whole gospel, he just sort of does this mic drop and walks off stage and we are left to answer that question. Mark does not teaspoon us the answers, right? We are left to answer that question. Who do you say that I am? And so what I wanna do before we get where we're going is I wanna talk just for a moment about where you've already been. Now, by this point in Mark's gospel, we're starting in Mark chapter four, verse 35. Here's what we've seen Jesus do. We've seen him heal a paralyzed man, a demon-possessed man, a leper, a man with a withered hand on the Sabbath, no less, scandal. And we have also seen, um, we have seen this tension building between Jesus and the scribes and Pharisees, right? Like by this point in the gospel, they do not like him. There is animosity and they've all already gone to, I think it's Herod, to discuss ways they might kill him, destroy him. And so now what's going to happen is we're going to shift. We've just been in the parables, and now we're going to shift to three miracles, this set of miracles, but we're also going to see the tension shift. And I want you to look for this. Because where the last, the, the last few weeks, you've been seeing this growing discontent, this growing animosity between Jesus and the Jewish authorities, now we're going to see this same tension between Jesus and his own disciples. Mark is going to show us a whole bunch of contrasts. We're going to contrast in every single miracle faith with fear. We're going to contrast clean with unclean. We're going to contrast life with death, salvation with lostness. And Mark is going to walk us through these miracles in the exact same way that he presented the parables. And, and this is so strange. When I was studying this, what I think Mark is doing here is that these miracles are actually parables in motion. They're live parables, and I'm going to explain that. I want to look at the last parable that you studied. That was Mark 4, 30 to 32, and here's what Jesus says. With what can we compare the kingdom of God? Or what parable shall we use for it? It's like a grain of mustard seed when, which, so, which when sown on the ground is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the other garden brand, uh, plants and puts out large branches so that the birds of the air can make its nests in its shade. And I just imagine they're all going, yeah, uh-huh, and? Your point is, and he's like, he who's got ears to hear, let him hear. And he walks off stage. And so that's what the parables do. They create this tension. They, they don't answer the problem for you. We are left to figure it out. And so now we're sitting here and we're like, well, okay, uh, what's the kingdom like? Well, we've got a really small seed. And then it grows and we've got birds in branches. What does this mean? And Mark's like, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. You are just going to have to figure it out. And oftentimes, particularly for those who have some sort of animosity toward Jesus, they're just left a little bit more confused than they were when they got in. And we're gonna see Mark do the exact same thing by the way he structures these miracle stories. Now, we're also going to see See, as we study 
that Mark wants you to know that there is a cost to becoming a follower of Christ. Here's what Mark is not. Mark is not a prosperity preacher. You're not gonna see him on TV asking you to send in your seed money so that Jesus can come along and bless you into a harvest of abundance. That is not Mark. No, Mark is moving us quickly to this place where Jesus is going to say, anyone who wants to be my disciple is gonna have to what? They're gonna have to take up their cross and they're going to have to physically follow me. And so Mark is is going to force us to come face to face with this question. What do we have to do if we wanna take up our cross and follow Jesus? Let's just open this up to the room. If I'm going to pick something up and hold it in my arms, what do I have to do before that? I got to empty my arms. That's exactly right. And so that means if I am going to follow Jesus, I can't come with my own agenda. I can't come with all my dreams. I can't come with all of my conditions. I have to lay that down at the foot of Christ. Oh, but that costs me something. Exactly. Exactly. And Mark is going to show us that being a disciple of Christ is not for the faint of heart. It's not for the selfish. It's not for the greedy. It's not for those who have their own plans and their own truth. And I'm going to do things my way. That, that is not the attitude that we can have. If we're going to follow Christ, we've got to set what is in our arms down so we can take up what Christ has for us. And so let's go ahead and get started with the first of our three miracles. I want to say one quick word about the disciples. Um, let, let's, let's call it the disciples measure of understanding as we move into this, okay? We've already talked about what they've seen Jesus do, right? I mean, they've, they have had front row seats to his preaching ministry. So they've heard all the good sermons. They've seen all the healings. They've also watched their Messiah kind of bow up to the religious leaders and authorities. And guess what didn't happen in this day and time in an honor-based society, Yeah, you just kind of didn't do that. Like you just didn't do that because they'd kick you out of the synagogue and then your whole world would be shattered. And so they are watching this man do things they've never seen anyone do. In fact, they've even heard by this point, Jesus title himself. What has Jesus titled himself? He's already called himself the son of man. Now, when you and I hear that, we immediately know that this is a messianic title, right? We know that Jesus is making a divinity statement about himself. He's making a God statement about himself. Well, the disciples uh, would not necessarily have known that. And here's why. It is an Old Testament term, son of man. You see it in uh, some of the prophetic apocalyptic literature. You see it in Daniel, but you never see it in connection with the Messiah. You never see it in connection with God's anointed, the one who will come on David's throne. In fact, you only see it in um, apocalyptic, like end time scenarios. And so what son of man meant to them was this big divine figure that would come at the end of the age. Okay, so they weren't connecting the dots yet. And we're going to see that as this first miracle unfolds. We're starting in verse 35. And one thing that you've already noticed is that Mark loves his time cues, doesn't he? What's Mark's favorite word? Immediately. Everything is immediately. Everything is urgent. Everything is right away. We have another time cue right here. It says, on that day, when evening had come, we have two time cues. We know that we're still on parable day, okay? We know that we're coming from the last scene that we just left when he was teaching parables. And now we know it's evening. And so we can assume that Jesus is tired. And he says to his disciples, let us go across to the other side. I want to say a word about this before we continue. Where is Jesus leading them? The physical answer is to the other side. What's the metaphorical answer? Where is he leading them? Into the storm. Straight into the heart of the storm. What does that tell us? Sometimes following Jesus leads us straight into the heart of the storm. 
And here's why I need to remember that. Because I tend to think that when things start to go wrong or when things get really wonky, that I must somehow be out of God's will. Here's a scenario. Has anyone ever gotten a job and you're pretty sure that's where the Lord wants you to be and you have confirmation here and you have confirmation here and then after a measure of time, it starts to get really hard and so what do we do? I must have been wrong. I must not be in God's will. God surely wants me to be comfortable so I'll find a new job. Except that what if that's your ministry? Except that what if we're put there to be a light in the dark? Except that what if these prickly people who make our lives so difficult are the very ones who need the gospel the most? And if we can't give it in words, at least we can give it in action and in love, right? And so sometimes we find ourselves in a mess of our own making. But other times we're led straight into the heart of the storm of our lives so that Christ can show himself mighty. And that's exactly why he led the disciples into this storm. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was, and other boats were with him. We're always going to pay attention to these little details. Other boats were with him. What does this tell us? It tells us we're in front of a great crowd of witnesses. It tells us this isn't happening in a far off place in a distant corner where no one can verify this. It's telling us that Mark is giving us a reliable account. And a great windstorm arose. Let me tell you something about the Sea of Galilee. Has anyone ever been to the Sea of Galilee? One person, two people. Okay, great. So you know the topography of the region, right? So here's what you have. You have these hills over here. They call them mountains. I lived in Colorado. Those ain't mountains, but we'll, we'll let them call them that. But so they have these hills that they think are mountains, and it's really cute. And then we have the Sea of Galilee. So what I want to talk to you about is the difference in elevation. Anybody know where the Sea of Galilee sits? I double-checked this morning. It's almost 700 feet below sea level. 700 feet below sea level, and it gets to about 200 feet deep. Let's talk about these mountains. Mountains. So the majority of them are between two and 3,000 feet high. There is one uh, Mount something or other. It's Mount uh, Moran that is approximately 4,000 feet high. Do I have any meteorologist hobbyists in here who just play around with weather because it's fun? Well, if I do, you already know what happens when you have cool wind rushing down from a high elevation that meets warm air coming up from a very low elevation. Anyone want to take a guess? Crazy storms, crazy storms. The Sea of Galilee is known for these wacko pop-up storms. So like Jesus's audience would have been like, yeah, which day? I mean, this is a normal occurrence when you have a front move in and that cool air comes down off the mountains and that warm air is rising up from 700 feet below sea level. And so what happens is you don't just get wind. This Greek word here, it takes three Greek words to describe this storm. This is hurricane force winds. Hurricane force winds. This is not one big straight line wind that pow and it's done. This is whipping and beating and we've got waves crashing over the boat and we've got grown men who are fishermen by trade shaking in their sandals. Okay? And here's what they do because here's what Jesus is doing. He is asleep in the stern. That's what the text says. He was in the stern asleep on the cushion. Let's talk about his position. Where is Jesus? Okay, he's asleep in the stern. And for so you and I, we think this. We think here's like the pointy part of the boat, right? And there's like a little, there must be a little cushion there and a place for him to lay. That's not what this was. This is describing the pilot's seat. So Jesus is in like the pilot's seat, which means he's in charge and he should be steering, but in fact, he's sleeping. And so the disciples are having like a major freak out. They're having a major freak out moment. And this is what they say. This is what they say. This is just utterly remarkable. Teacher, do you not care that we're perishing? Okay, what kind of a response is that? That's not a question. That's an accusation. Do you not care? Ladies, they're being sarcastic. 
they're accusing him of not caring that they're perishing. And the way this text is structured, it says he awoke in rebuke, and, and word order is funky in Greek. It doesn't really matter quite as much. So when you're reading this in its original language, you totally think he's going to wake up and rebuke the disciples. That's exactly what it looks like. That is the thrust of this passage, but he surprises us. As he awoke, he rebuked the wind and the sea and said, said peace, be still. This word for be still is so juicy. It's fun. It means to muzzle. These, are, these words, by the way, are the same ones he's used previously in casting out a demon. Okay, this is a sharp imperative. This is a rebuke. And he is literally muzzling the wind with his words. He's muzzling the wind. And it says, and the wind ceased and there was a great calm. And he said to them, why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith after all this time? after healings and casting out demons and everything I've told you, after everything you've seen, have you still no faith? And it says they were filled with a great fear. The Greek there says, and they were afraid with a great fear. They were afraid with a great fear, which is a, a double punch. It's like a super afraid. And they said to one another, who then is this? This is the great question of the Gospel of Mark. Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? And just like in a parable, we move on to the next scene without a clear answer. Mark is not going to teaspoon feed us. Okay, so what did we see contrasted there? We saw the, a big contrast of obedience and disobedience, right? We have the wind and the waves obeying and the disciples getting all snarky and we have faith and we have fear. Those are our two big contrasts. Now we're gonna move on to the next miracle. They came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasenes. Has anyone noticed in your Bible that there might be a footnote or something that says there is some dispute over where this place actually is? Because if you're familiar with this area, the, the place where the Gerasenes is, is problematic because there is not a hill there, okay? But there are two other potential um, areas listed that, that uh, could be this place, and one of them is right, and I'll tell you what's going on here. I wish I would have written down what it's called. All three of them start with a G. Okay, essentially what Mark is doing is he's, he's in Europe, and someone asks him where he's from, and he says, Flower Mound, Texas, Right? That's not what you would do. What would I do if I was in Europe and someone said, well, where are you from? Well, the first thing I would do is I would say the States. All right, I'd say, I wouldn't say America because that'd be North America or South America or Central America. I would say the States. And then if they were familiar with the States, they would say where? And then I would say Texas. And if they're familiar with Texas, I would say what? Dallas, right? I'm not gonna say Flower Mound, Texas because no one knows where that is. That is exactly what's going on here. The Gerasenes is the place that, uh, remember Mark is writing primarily to Gentiles. They would have known where the Gerasenes was. They would not have known where this little map dot was. And so the Bible can be trusted. That is not a problem. Okay. When Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit. Here comes some irony. Mark also loves irony. He lived, here comes a contrast, among the dead. And you're going to see that Mark repeats this word tombs over and over again because he wants you to show, he wants you to see explicitly that we are contrasting life and death here. And this guy is really frightening. It says no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain, for he had often been bound with shackles and chains, that saying chains around his hands and essentially fetters around his feet. But he wrenched the chains apart and he broke the shackles in pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs, he brings it up again. And on the mountains, he was always crying out. Oh, this word, this word. You know what that word means in Greek? It is agonized shrieking. No words, just agonized shrieks all night long and cutting himself with stones. Now I want to talk about, I know I'm getting a teens technical. It's important to the story, I promise. I want to talk about the order of events here. All right. 
And I'm gonna tell you why I believe that this is the case. So Mark is writing in a, in a verb tense, all right? You and I work with past, present, and future, right? He is writing in a verb tense that is unusual for narrative. It is called the imperfect tense, okay? Imperfect is a form of past tense that insinuates continuing action. If I were to say in simple past tense, I wrote, it means I wrote something. I might have written one big thing. I might have written one small thing. We don't know. We just know that I started it and I completed it. If I were to speak to you in the imperfect tense, I could say I was writing. Well, what were you writing? How long did you write? Are you still writing this piece? It kind of insinuates that I'm working on something and I was writing it and at a future date, I will continue writing it. That is the difference between the past tense and the imperfect tense. Why does this matter? Because what I am going to propose to you is that this demoniac saw Jesus while he was still in the boat, okay? And immediately when he saw him, started racing toward Jesus because it says that when Jesus stepped out of the boat, immediately he fell in front of Jesus. And then we have kind of this verbal sparring going on back and forth. But the way the text presents itself, it looks like the man is talking and then Jesus is talking and the man is talking and then Jesus is talking. And that's not how this goes. I'm going to show you exactly what I mean. Okay. Stay with me. Um, when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him. Let's pause on this word. I have a slide for this word. I want you to see it. This is the word proskuneo. When you are talking about someone falling at someone's feet, there are two Greek words to choose from. One, we will see later with Jairus when he falls at Jesus' feet, the ruler of the synagogue. This is a different word. Is the definition up? It sure is. This is the word we're looking at. To express in attitude or gesture one's complete dependence on or submission to a high authority figure. Why is this important? It's important because this this is the word worship. This is the word worship. When you see this word in the Bible, proskuneo, you are seeing worship. Why didn't our translators use worship? Because we tend to attach something to worship that was not originally part of worship, and that is devotion. That is love. And that is how we worship. And that is certainly the proper way to worship. But it is not necessarily included in the definition of worship. And I think it's important that we know that when the demons see Jesus, they fall on their face and worship him. They submit to him. They admit complete dependence on him, as we will see as the text goes on and acknowledgement that he is a high authority figure. And crying out in a loud voice, he said, it's actually, and he was crying out in a loud voice and he was saying, what have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. Here we come on the imperfect tense again. For he, Jesus, was saying to him, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. So who was talking first? Jesus. Jesus was talking first. Jesus got out of the boat, knew immediately what was going on and started saying, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. This does not insinuate he said it once. This insinuates that he started saying it and he is still saying it. So what is the demon doing? This is fascinating because he is in a posture of worship, which he must do because Jesus is the king of the universe, which is what Mark is showing us. But here's what he's doing. He is trying to exert authority over Jesus. How do we know that? Because he uses his name and he uses his title. And in the ancient Near East and in the first century, they believed they had no problem with the spiritual world. They had no problem with the spiritual realm whatsoever. And they believed that in order to have control over an unclean spirit, you needed to name it. In order to have control over anything, you needed to name it. What did God do with Adam? First thing, when he put him in the garden, he set him about naming the animals. Why? Because this was a move to establish Adam's authority. This demon face down in front of Jesus is trying to have a measure of authority over him. Now Mark's just being silly. Now he's just like, this is so ridiculous, I just don't even know what to do. And then Jesus asked him. Now Jesus is one-upping him. 
what is your name? And, and the demon obeys because he has no choice. He replied, my name is Legion, for we are many. And here's another contrast. Jesus commands, he begs, and he begged him. You're going to see this word come up quite a bit. Earnestly not to send them out of the country. Now a great herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside. And they, I want you to notice now that we've switched, um, we've switched the numbers of persons. First it was he one, begging, and now we have they, the demons, begging. They begged him, saying, send us to the pigs, let us enter them. And Jesus gives them permission. I mean, he doesn't cast them to outer darkness, which is what I would expect him to do. And the unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs. And the herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the sea. Let's take just a moment and think about what this looked like. 2,000 pigs. You know, they're, they're upwards of what? How many hundred pounds? 300, 400 pounds. That's a lot of pigs. 2,000 pigs all rushing down this hill into the Sea of Galilee. That's going to take a minute. So we've got the sound of thundering. We've got dust clouds rising. We've got pigs shrieking. That's not a pleasant sound. And then we have 2,000 pig carcasses in the water, decaying, birds picking at them, rotting away in the sun. I mean, this is, they were talking about, the, it's in the Bible, they were talking about this for decades to come. And so, of course, no surprise, the herdsmen fled and told it in the city and in the country that word fled means escape. It's to flee in terror as though for their lives. And the people came to see what it was that had happened. And they came to Jesus and saw the demon-possessed man. This means that they are sitting there trying to figure him out. They are watching him intently. They're not just glancing and looking away. They are very, they're trying to figure out if this is the same guy. They're trying to figure out what has been going on. And then Mark reminds us who he is. Yes, the one who had the legion. What is he doing? Now he's sitting there clothed and in his right mind and they were afraid. And those who had seen it described to them what had happened to the demon-possessed man and to the pigs. And they began to beg Jesus, here's our contrast again, to depart from the region. And so Jesus does. Again, he permits this. He leaves. And as he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed with demons begged him that he might be with him. Now, this is strange all of a sudden, Jesus is not permitting. We're kind of in a rhythm now. I mean, if you're listening to this, which was the way most people would have become acquainted with these stories, if you are sitting there listening to someone read this letter, you hear beg, permit, beg, permit, beg, permit. What? Wait a minute. We've got someone who wants to be with Jesus and Jesus doesn't permit him? Well, let's talk about what's going on here. Let's talk about these herdsmen, okay? So we've got a contrast of fear and faith. And what's so striking to me is we have this terrifying man, really. I mean, he lived among, lived among the tombs, um, agonized, shrieking all night long, cutting himself with stones. He was probably emaciated. Um, he was so strong that every time they tried to bind him, there are two words for break apart used in this narrative. The one used to where he broke apart his foot chains is crushed, smashed. So he's like, he's not just ripping the chains apart, he's taking the ones around his feet and he's going like Hulk smash, right? He's just like, like turning them into shreds of steel. And, and so they're terrified of him, but then they come and they see, well, now he's sitting with this man who has healed him, who has saved him. He's in his right mind. He's fully clothed. No one knows where he got the robe. And he is sitting there dialoguing with Jesus and with the disciples. And they tell Jesus to leave. Why? Because they esteem their lifestyle. They esteem their um, economy more than they would esteem a man. And it just shows how far gone this crowd was. And so what does Jesus do? I mean, he's there with them. He will heal their diseases. He will do for this man what he did for them. This is my alarm because I have a meeting in a couple minutes. But 
Uh, so we're going to wrap it up shortly. Um, but what's going on here is that they are not, they are choosing to send Jesus away. So what does Jesus do? This is genius. This is genius. He tells the man, no, you're not going to stay with me, but here's what you're going to do. You go back to your house, go back to your people, and you tell them, you tell them what I've done for you and the mercy I have shown you. And then I love what the text says. I love what it says. It says, and he went away and began to proclaim. Oh, that word is preach. Caruso, that word is preach. He went away and began to preach in the Decapolis. That's a 10 city region. How much Jesus had done for him and how everyone marveled in that great they try to send Jesus away <laughs> and they can't shut this guy up. They try to, they ask Jesus to remove his presence. And what does he do? He leaves his word. He leaves his word because God never abandons us. Never. No matter how far we run from him, God never abandons us. We're going to move on now to the last miracle. Again, we're going to see contrasts between faith and fear, life and death, cleanliness and uncleanliness. It says, and when Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered about him and he was beside the sea. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name. So here's what I want you to notice. So Mark titles him and then he names him. But when he brings him back up, he is going to continue to call him ruler of the synagogue, ruler of the synagogue, ruler of the synagogue. Why is he doing this? Well, let me ask you this. What have the rulers of the synagogue been doing up until this point? Conspiring to kill Jesus. And we are contrasting faith with fear. And we have someone who is probably very afraid of his reputation, but he's even more afraid for his daughter's life. And so what does he do in the midst of his fear? He takes a step of faith because he knows that Jesus has the power to save his daughter. Jairus by name and seeing him, he fell at his feet. This is our other word now. He just goes prostrate before the Lord and implored. That is the same word. That's our begged. That's our begged because if we want something, it has to pass through Jesus. Begged him earnestly saying, my little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well. That word is actually saved. That is the word saved and lived. And Jesus went with him. And a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. They're jostling him. They're pressing in on him. And there was a woman who had had a discharge of blood for 12 years. Now, again, the, this is the same imperfect tense. And so that means even though we're just reading it now, this has likely, her story is going on simultaneously with Jairus' story. I'll tell you why I think that's important. She had, uh, had a discharge of blood for 12 years and she had suffered much under many physicians and spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. This is a contrastive conjunction. And what that's telling us is that this is, this is just, it's supposed to go this way. The reader thinks it's going to go this way, but oh no, it's going this way. This is emphasizing her dire situation. Where are we? Lost my place. Okay, so she had heard the reports about Jesus. I'm going to propose that perhaps she heard Jairus. Perhaps she heard Jairus. Why? Here's why. She came up behind him in the crowd and she touched his garment for she said, if I touch even his garment, that's an unusual word to put right there. Why would she say even his garment? Why wouldn't she say just touch his garment? Because she had just heard Jairus say, come and lay hands on my daughter. Her faith is so strong that she says, I don't even need your hands. Lord, just give me the threads that are touching you and I'll be made well, I'll be saved. 
And she was right. Immediately the flow of blood dried up and she felt in her person, in her body, that she was healed of her disease. And at the same instant, Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, who touched my garments? And the disciples do it again. They do it again. Look at this. This is unbelievable. And his disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing around you and yet you, st- you say, who touched me? So we've got a Jewish leader who is showing faith. This is an honor, shame, patriarchal society, which means women were pretty far down on the totem pole. Woman, cattle, hard to decide what's worth more in those days. Who, you know, a woman's going to fetch a bride price, but I'm telling you, if you've got a good cow, it's kind of right there. I mean, that's just the way it was. And we've got an unclean woman showing extraordinary faith. She doesn't even need hands laid on her. And the disciples are responding in sarcasm. The lack of faith is astounding. And Jesus is so patient. He just continues doing what he does. And he looked around to see who had done it, but the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. Why is that important? Because this woman has three strikes against her. She should have come in fear and trembling. Strike number one, she's a woman in a patriarchal, honor-driven society, and she had just touched a man. Let's talk about some of the things you don't do in a patriarchal, honor-driven society. You don't touch a man, ever. Even your husband, not in public, because you know what they did in the marketplace when they were out in public? The women walked behind the men, and they did not meet the eyes of other men. That was strike number one. Strike number two, she was unclean. And if you are familiar with Leviticus 5, and who among us aren't, then you already know all of the purity rituals that she had to go through after her monthly flow of blood to become clean. And she was unclean. And what did that mean? That mean anyone she bumped and touched along the way was also made unclean. And she touched the teacher's robe. It should have become unclean. That's strike number two. Strike number three is she was willfully disobeying the Levitical law. Three strikes against her. And yet she tells him the whole truth. I've had a flow of blood for 12 years. I am unclean. I can't fellowship with people. I am desperate. I have spent everything I have. And if you don't help me, if you don't save me, I will die. That was her situation. And what does he say? He does something he doesn't do anywhere else. He says, daughter, your faith has saved you. I know your text says made you well. It says saved you. And I'd like to remind you that we got a guy named Jairus standing right there who just heard Jesus say, daughter, your faith has saved you. What's Jesus doing? What's Jesus doing? It's unusual that he would allow, a rabbi would allow himself to be interrupted in this way. He's saying, I see you, daughters. I see you, daughter. In a world and in a culture where we sometimes don't have the same opportunities, don't make the same amount of money. What is Jesus doing? I esteem you, daughter. I see you, daughter. You are worthy, daughter. You are worthy of saving. You're worthy of healing and you are worthy of flourishing. Go and be healed of your disease. I see you, daughter. In a culture that esteemed women not, he esteemed daughters. And that is the heart of Jesus. That's the heart of Jesus. Okay, I've got to speed up. While he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house someone who said, your daughter 
is dead, why trouble the teacher any further? And this is just this overlapping action. But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, another nod to, hey guys, this is a Jew who's showing great faith, do not fear, only believe. And he allowed no one else to follow him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. They came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and Jesus saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. So what's, what he's describing right here is chaos and confusion. Okay, we've got people weeping and wailing and there's words and there's no words and there's all people jostling and it's just chaotic. This is describing chaos and we're gonna come back to that. And so what does he do? He speaks, he speaks order into the chaos. Why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. We see another contrast here, ridicule and faith. But he put them all outside. It's about darn time. He put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kumi, which means little girl, I say to you, arise. And this is the richest, most beautiful language. And immediately it says the girl got up. You know what that Greek word is? Resurrected. Resurrected. What is Mark doing? He's saying you haven't seen anything yet. You haven't seen anything yet. And immediately the little girl resurrected and began walking. That could also be translated began living for she was 12 years of age and they were immediately overcome with amazement. Finally, another proper response. And he strictly charged them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. Drop mic, exit stage left. This is what we're left with. So what... What is Mark doing here? We've got three parables. Mark is, this is my argument, this is my thesis. In no uncertain terms, Mark is trying to convince you that Jesus is God. Got God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. He is making an argument that this Jesus, this Son of Man, is God. God in the flesh. Why do I say that? Because what does John tell us in his gospel? That Jesus came to do the work of the Father and he does only what he has seen the Father do and he does only what the Father has told him. And here's something that you can put in your pocket. God does the same thing over and over, but never the same way twice. And we are seeing that here in the miracle on the sea. What do we have? We have chaos and confusion. What does this remind us of? It reminds us of in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and the earth was formless and void. It was chaotic and confusion. And what was the spirit doing? Hovering over the waters. And what did God do? He spoke order over the chaos. He said, let there be light. And what is Jesus doing? We have God at rest. Why? Because he's not concerned. We have God at rest, but we have chaos and confusion and a people who need saving. And so God gets up and the spirit is hovering because where Jesus is, the spirit is hovering over the waters. And what does God do? He speaks. What does he speak? He speaks order into the chaos. Silent, be muzzled. He is doing a new creation because he's ushering in a new kingdom with a new people and a new order of doing things. In this kingdom, the last will be first and the first will be last. In this kingdom, God sees daughters. In this kingdom, God esteems the lowly. He touches the lepers. He heals the sight of the blind. He unlooses the tongue of the mute. This is an upside down kingdom. And Mark is showing us that this Jesus is sovereign over nature, miracle number one, sovereign over the supernatural, miracle number two, sovereign over illness, miracle number three, and sovereign over death itself in miracle number four. Who do you say that I am? Mark is going to leave us with no excuse and no room for doubt that this man, this Jesus is none other than God himself dwelling among us. Because that's what we need. We need God with us. We need him with us, which is why he's with us 
because he knows that you're lonely and he knows that you're tired and he knows that you're grieving and he knows that you're worn out and he knows that sometimes you just feel like you can't do it anymore. We don't need a self-improvement plan. We need God with us. So what are our action items? I have to read them off the screen because I needed Chris to write them for me because mine were really bad. Action item number one, choose faith. This week, identify specific areas of your day-to-day life where you struggle to trust his sovereignty. Ask him for practical ways. You can step into faith and away from fear. Here's what I want to propose to you. Faith and fear are always going to coexist in your heart. And Jairus shows us that's okay. The bleeding woman shows us that's okay. It's okay to be afraid. Just do it afraid. Just move forward afraid. Just trust him afraid. It's okay. We're always going to have that tension. But I will tell you this. The one that wins is the one you feed. So what can you actively do this week to feed your faith instead of your fear? The second one is practice. Look for situations in your life where you know you will actively choose to practice what we know instead of reacting to what we fear. I have a phrase for this. I call it practicing the certainty of God's sovereignty. I'll say it again. Practicing the certainty of God's sovereignty. What does that look like? It means, okay, God, if you're really sovereign over this, how then should I behave? If you're really sovereign over this, how then should I react? If you're really sovereign, if you really love this person, how then shall I respond? God, if you're really real, and for argument's sake, I'm going to assume that you are, if you're real and sovereign, then how then should I react? That is practicing the certainty of God's sovereignty. And now I am late for a meeting, so we are going to pray, and you are going to have a fabulous day and a fabulous discussion, and I love you all. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time. Thank you for your word. You take our breath away, Jesus We confess that you are the son of God, God with us. And we confess that it is is your spirit in which we walk and live and move and have our being. And we confess that that God the father has sent you who sent the spirit to reconcile us to you so that we may reconcile others to you. Lord God, help us to do that. Help us to love you more than we already do. Help us to choose faith over fear. And when the fear won't go away, Lord, empower us to just do it afraid. We love you so much, God. We praise you. We worship you. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.